So if you sort of reflect on the sequence of uh, sessions that we have had. In the first session, uh, we heard the perspective uh, of the Secretary uh, of uh, Ministry of Corporate Affairs. So that's the perspective of minister, min ministry. And then we had uh, the fireside chat where we heard the perspective of a regulator. And then we just heard uh, the Chief Executive Officer of State Bank of India giving the perspective of a banker. So we have heard from three constituents, but we have not heard from several key uh, players uh, in the insolvency process. And the panel is intended to fill that gap. So what I'm going to ask now, each of the panel members, uh, you have the biographies in front of you, but nevertheless, it will be useful if each panel member can take a minute or two to introduce yourself, the firm that you represent, and then give um, uh, perhaps uh, a eight to ten minutes overview of where you stand with respect to IBC and the various uh, institutions that have developed as part of that ecosystem, so that we get an idea about uh, you know how lawyers and you know how corporate borrowers and uh, you know folks dealing on the other side, uh, so to speak, uh, look at this uh, uh, bankruptcy reform. So I'm going to start uh, with the panel member immediately to my left, uh, and then we'll set the process going. Thank you. Thanks. <coughs> Can I borrow the mic? Oh, yes, sorry. Good afternoon. My name is Narendra Murkumbi. Uh, I have been an entrepreneur uh, since uh, I graduated from business school in 1994. Uh, most recently, uh, I was uh, founder and headed uh, Sri Renuka Sugars. Uh, now that's a company which I stepped out of, uh, consequent to a sale of the controlling stake to a multinational company called Wilmar uh, in uh, March 2018, which is about less than a year ago. Uh, it was a debt resolution uh, which was done outside uh, IBC, but uh, about 6,000 crores, uh, but uh, obviously done within the, more or less within the current framework that exists in this country uh, in terms of debt resolution and uh, insolvency and bankruptcy. So uh, now after having exited from that company, obviously uh, I am, uh, being a born entrepreneur, I, I'm now looking at assets. We, in fact, I and my team uh, did our first bid for an asset under IBC uh, last month. So it's been interesting to see uh, the perspective uh, from both sides. Maybe you want me to speak now or you want the introduction? Uh, well, what I would be, yeah. so you have done uh, one restructuring yeah. outside of the IBC right. yeah. and you are in the process of be doing one within the rubric of the IBC. Yes, as now as an acquirer rather than as a debtor. So, yeah. so you, you, uh, could you uh, give a sense from your perspective, yeah. what are the uh, differences that you're noticing yeah. Yeah, yeah. and uh, in what ways you would consider IBC as an improvement yeah. over the outs outside uh, yeah. you know, option that you yeah. took in yeah. the yeah. earlier situation? Yeah. So I'll speak a little bit from my first-hand experience, which may be of value, without getting too much into the specifics of, uh, of one particular company. So I think for a lot of us who, who got over-leveraged and ran into difficulties, uh, if we look back, I think we, we all grew our companies rapidly in a much more optimistic and liberal time. This post-2008, when uh, uh, you know, uh, central banks across the world in, in increased the taps of liquidity, and post that from 2009 to 2015, uh, we had not only great liquidity, we also had a big surge in commodity prices which lifted up the prospects of a lot of industries. So that is, I think that's where a lot of the leverage came which, which had to be resolved post 2015. Uh, I think uh, in terms of IBC, the way I see the process, it's clearly overloaded. I think right in its infancy, it got loaded with more than 1,000 cases within a very short period. Uh, there was, today there is a lot more clarity when we started our resolution process back in 2016, the law was very, very new, There's no, sir, there was no clarity on how it will evolve, how the process will end. There hadn't been a single case which was about 2000, about, uh, 2000 crore that had been successfully resolved from start to finish. But I think what it has done and probably its most positive effect and I think Mr. Rajnish Kumar also said this in his talk, is that it gives you, uh, uh, you know, um, boundary 
uh, and tells you that if you cannot stay within the boundary, then you will lose your company. And that I think is a very salutary effect. The problem has been that a lot of companies leverage in a far more liberal environment and now the whole problem is intractable because with current RBI regulations and the IBC, it, it becomes almost impossible to pull back from the situation. And that is where I think is uh, you're getting most of the litigation concerned with, with especially with very large cases where uh, shareholders tend to be, uh, you know, resourceful and have, have a lot of resources across the globe uh, to fight the system. Uh, but having said that, going forward, I think for every case that goes into IBC, there are probably two that are getting resolved amicably outside it because of the pressure of IBC. That, that would be my personal uh, experience. Uh, I think uh, uh, then we come uh, to the very important second point, which was that on Feb 12, 2018, last year, uh, the RBI came with a, with a circular which was significantly more stringent than anything they had done in, the, in this field of debt resolution, which is basically that companies showing uh, signs of stress had to be resolved, had to resolve, uh, the, initially it's for big companies, but you have to resolve this within 180 days, otherwise you have, you have to compulsorily go into IBC. Uh, I'm, I mean, I might have issues with uh, the, the time period allowed. I, I, I believe it, it, it needs a longer time. Uh, but the intent, I think, is, is in the right direction. Why do I say you need more time? Because if you see some of the big sectors which are going into uh, stress, uh, I think there are largely three sectors. One is commodities, metals, agri-commodities, the engineering sector and the power sector. And almost in every sector, one of the biggest problems has been government policy, uncertainties regarding that, legal decisions including Supreme Court decisions, reversing allotment of natural resources. So these are not necessarily things that can be resolved in 180 days. So in a way, by being on a, such a strong timeline, we probably uh, destroyed a lot of value that could have been recovered from some of these companies. That's, that's my personal feel of the situation. It's created, I think, too much pressure now. Probably if I, I were to be asked for a session, I would say you need, you need to give companies a year, companies and bankers a year to resolve issues before you are compulsorily forced into IBC. Uh, 180 days is just too little. And what has finally happened is that a lot of companies in the most stretched sectors like power have gone to the Supreme Court. And we've effectively had now a stay for the last four months on, on proceedings. So people have bought time somehow. Yeah. And the last thing which I have seen is regardless of what bankers and, and shareholders do, a big factor in terms of value maximization has been government policy. And the best example has been in the steel sector where government intervention in terms of anti-dumping duties, etc., lifted the sector fundamentals which allowed uh, you know, new investors or acquirers to acquire assets at fairly decent values. This has been a great outcome for bankers. I think the same thing were done in, I, I saw, we benefited a little bit as, as we were closing our process of restructuring outside IBC. The government of India came out with uh, several policy measures to support the sugar sector and that helped the overall resolution. So I think that is a very unspoken but very important part of, of, of resolving this. And now, uh, coming to my uh, recent experience as a potential acquirer, I think uh, the fact is that uh, we've looked at assets in IBC both uh, under the IBC uh, process, resolution process as well as liquidation assets. And, and especially for liquidation assets, we are still very, very new. There are very little precedent in terms of what happens. We're talking of liquidation uh, sales as a going concern. Nobody's clear how that works, whether it is with tax, with the licenses. In many cases, you have allotments of resources. For example, a cement company has a, has a limestone concession. Does that, if, if you're liquidating under, uh, you know, uh, going concern, does that transfer along with it? So you can have a lot of legal views, but there is not enough judicial precedent. So it's going to take time, I think, for people to be more confident and value would probably and competition would increase once that happens. I don't think we are there yet. And the other thing is that you always seem to have the ghost of the original promoter hovering around the companies. In most cases, there is 
attempts, successful, not so successful, to game the process, whether it's to influence the uh, resolution professional or to influence some of the bidders, or even in some cases to have a change in the ownership or part of the debt so that, you know, uh, original shareholders, original promoters have a role in it. So that's part of the environment today you deal with when you're bidding for companies. And I think we've seen it with big companies and, in, and with smaller companies it's even more prevalent. I seek a clarification. Yeah. Uh, these uh, terminologies are a little bit confusing yeah. for me. My understanding of resolution professionals is that uh, when the company my goes, when the uh, my understanding of the resolution professional is that when the company is received by the creditors, yeah. the resolution professionals run the company. That's would right. I, would I, That's and what you're saying is the original promoter uh, is able to influence That's right. uh, That's the resolution right. professionals. That's right. That's right. Is that legal? It's, it's, an, it's not. <laughs> it's you. very hard to prove, right? Influence is hard to prove. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But I think uh, the biggest. So I, for anybody who is uh, who is running in a competitive environment, I think it's part of of the course to to deal with all these things. What would really help and unlock value and create uncertainty is a bit more legal precedent, which will probably come, come with the passage that. of another year or two. Right. Thank you. So that's that's my. Sure, thanks. Uh, so my name is uh, Kaustup Kulkarni. I head the uh, group M&A and uh, strategic financing for uh, JSW Group, uh, more specifically, of course, JSW Steel. Um, you know, so the, uh, the perspective that really I can um, add value over here is that we are obviously a flagship uh, steel company. We are the largest uh, steel producers in the country today. Uh, steel, uh, you know, as an industry has, has gone through probably the largest uh, consolidation slash uh, restructuring slash resolution that you've um, seen under the IBC process over the past year, year and a, year and a half. Uh, so I think what I'd like to do is really share my experiences, uh, you know, during the course of the last one year. Uh, uh, and through that, I'll, I'll try to bring out some of the learnings as well as the uh, issues that we kind of, you know, continue to uh, face. So my perspective is going to be of a resolution applicant or a, or a strategic uh, player in the steel business uh, who has participated in trying to acquire a lot of the companies that have really come up as part of the, uh, part of the bankruptcy uh, code. So I think first, um, you know, the, the, the most common question is, you know, uh, what, is, what is my impression of uh, whether the process, generally speaking, has been a successful uh, process or has the uh, code been a successful code or not. Uh, there, is, there is a lot that goes for it. There is a lot that still needs to be achieved. But if I were to, you know, just look at it on the whole and give you a feeling, uh, I think the feeling is good, which means that, you know, I think in general it's been a very, very, uh, successful legislation. Uh, it's something which is moving in the right direction and has managed, uh, you know, to really achieve what it has set out to. So I think the fact that, um, you know, 20% of the Indian steel industry is either getting resolved or will be resolved over the period of the next six months is, I think, a big deal, right? It's, India is a 100, 105 million ton uh, producing steel country. The, the companies that were under the uh, bankruptcy were close to about 20 million tons of uh, kind of capacity, right? So that's a large amount of capacity that is getting resolved over a period of, let's say, two years. I think that's a, that's a you know, great achievement. So I think that's the first thing. The second thing is, you know, as, you, as, as we have gone along this process over the past one year, there have been, there have been numerous, uh, numerous learnings. So when we first sort of went into this uh, process, we you know, we, we assumed, probably we were a bit naive and we assumed that the process was going to be fairly uh, straightforward. You know, people would call for bids, you, you know, you bid, you're either, uh, either win or lose based on what you've quoted and you sort of move along uh, in life. Um, uh, but then, you know, we, uh, we forgot that, you know, India by nature can also be very uh, litigative and um, I think somebody referred to the fact that uh, in the U.S., uh, the, the U.S. lawyers like the bankruptcy code for the fact that it has a lot of wiggle room or a lot of loopholes. I think we, we learned that uh, the hard way over here, which is that there is a lot of that wiggle room which is uh, available. And I think that has 
manifested itself through a lot of litigation uh, along the way. Uh, you know, the litigation has been in, in multiple uh, forms. Of course, 29A, etc., is is still pending, and that's one of the largest issues which is still pending. But uh, you know, even even this whole thing about maximization of value versus achieving a resolution within a finite period of time, I think that has been a, a big sort of argument uh, out there. And I think Mr. Rajneesh Kumar referred to it when he said that bidders keep revising their plans, right? So when we originally went in, we thought that that's not supposed to happen. When you when you move forward, you, re you realize that's sort of par for the course, right? And then. Uh, you're, you're sort of competing in that new competitive uh, kind of landscape. Uh, so I think one thing which has been clearly established is, uh, and this is not just the lenders, but also been established by the courts, uh, is that maximization of value of the corporate debtor is, is key to the, the whole process. And that maximization doesn't mean it's maximization of value for one player, which is just the lender. It also means what is the plan you're putting in the table in terms of making the unit sustainable sort of for the uh, future. Um, has, the, has the objective of uh, therefore resolving cases within a finite period of time being sacrificed in the process? I think temporarily there is probably some sacrifice on the time in favor of maximization. But my belief is uh, as we go forward and as the legal precedents are, are set, the time that it takes to resolve is automatically going to sort of rebalance and therefore you're, you're probably going to have a good balance between uh, these two objectives kind of going forward. So I think that's one thing. The other thing is as a, as a resolution applicant, one thing you realize after you get into the process, and maybe this is, this is the normal, uh, is when you start diligencing an asset, it's when you realize that this is no different from a very hostile situation. Right? Uh, in the sense that these are forced bankruptcies. These are promoters who are being forced by the creditors to give up their, uh, their companies. So to that extent, you know, being able to do the full extent of diligence, getting the right amount of data into the data room, uh, being fully aware of uh, you know, uh, what lies ahead in terms of contingent liabilities, litigations, is, is a challenging uh, kind of uh, process. Uh, the NCLT does have a power to take all of that pain away uh, by having the right to write off a lot of the other claims. But I think even that has been a kind of a mixed bag in terms of some of the uh, judgments that have come about. So I think that's one thing which uh, you know, does impact your, your valuations and the way you look at these uh, kind of targets. I think secondly, there are, you know, as in any case, there are always some pain points which still exist in terms of stamp duties, in terms of taxation. For example, on the tax front, uh, it's really funny that, you know, because, because some part of the debt is getting shaved off today, uh, the shave off of that debt appears as an income in the, in the books of the target. And that is subject to a minimum alternate tax, even though the company is really not, not profitable, right? So, and clearly, no acquirer is going to want to uh, pay that tax. So I think that is a reform that needs to sort of come about uh, on the tax side. If, if I may interject, uh, on that point, have you communicated uh, this to uh, the Ministry of uh, Corporate Affairs, or is there a is there a, a, a process by which you could communicate this? I, th I think there are there are enough and more representations which have come. In fact, there, I just read a newspaper article two days ago which says the the IT department is actually in the process of actively looking at this provision uh, because this is this has been known for for quite some time and very actively represented yes similarly i think you know stamp you know india is a is a galore of stamp duties right whatever business you need to do anything any transfers require state stamp duties central stamp duties so on and so forth so i think that is the other issue that you know over a period of time needs to sort of get sorted out but i think in the big picture these are still the smaller kind of uh, uh, kind of tweaks I think the third issue that I really want to uh, focus on, which impacts us very significantly, is the issue of financing. Uh, which is, you know, as, as a buyer of these, these targets, you need to finance yourself, right? Some of these are fairly large cases. And the, the ability of any Indian company to get financing for an acquisition has historically always been limited in India, right? So for some reason, uh, financing and acquisition is looked at as a bad thing. So for example, by default, an Indian bank can't finance a local acquisition of shares, right? Of course, in this specific instance, for, for bankruptcy cases, the RBI has been proactive enough and has already made that exemption. 
but i think the indian financial system is is going through a you know a bit of a churn if you've been tracking the uh, recent developments on the on the nbfc crisis that happened in the country recently and also the sort of dearth of capital that a lot of the banks are facing so the country is in a situation where assets are really consolidating in fewer hands right so which means those fewer number of groups need more money but at the same time the rbi regulation has gone in the direction of restricting banks from lending more money to the same corporate groups which means the statutory borrowing limits of a lot of the banks have actually been reduced recently right so that makes it a big challenge for local uh, players to finance these acquisitions beyond a point which takes you to the fact that can you diversify offshore can you get foreign investors to uh, come and uh, participate now even on that front you know external commercial borrowings there's a there's a policy in place there's a framework in place you can't borrow for for an acquisition unless you have a specific cap capex as an end use etc foreign portfolio investors were in between you know putting significant amount of capital uh, into the country to the debt route but even that has now got limited because because there were certain regulations which uh, prohibit them from taking more than a certain you know percentage of exposure to their total funds to a specific corporate group etc so i think somewhere unless the the funding space really opens up right and you have more people willing to lend to this space at some point of time the ability to resolve these assets and therefore for newer people to come and buy them is going to be restricted by the ability to fund on on that point i want to wait uh, run uh, and see what rana has to say on that because uh, you are working with some bidding Uh, that requires obviously obviously some financing so uh, yeah. and i have a few questions on that but i'm going to reserve those questions until i have heard uh, no, so i'm i'm pretty much done that's okay. that's what okay. sort of i had to say okay run uh hi my name is yash rana yeah. i'm a partner and uh, asia chairman at goodwin proctor in hong kong goodwin is a us based law firm and uh, in in asia we represent many private equity and uh, other global investors investing into asian companies mainly in uh, china and india um so in in india working with private equity firms uh we've represented them in the ibc context uh partnering with a strategic uh locally um uh, in making bids on on some of these stressed assets uh most recently in the bhushan steel situation and uh So my perspective is that of uh you know working with foreign investors investing in, in into the market. Uh my my friend Suharsh uh is at AZB and will will talk more about the uh uh IBC in in, in as a uh Indian lawyer and, and and specialist in that. Um so I would say having worked on Indian matters since 1997 and uh and come across various iterations of uh of creditors rights and uh, and similar provisions the ibc has been a uh, major step forward i think we've heard from many people today uh that uh there is some we heard some statistics about four and a half years ago uh, it took four and a half years to resolve um uh, an insolvency with 25% uh, recovery or even less uh and obviously those statistics have improved radically uh since the ibc came in um we also heard there's some imperfections which is not not surprising uh you know the as ed mentioned the uh the us code was was uh, adopted in 1978 and still continues to evolve through bankruptcy court judgments uh and i think we'll see that over the next several years in uh, in in india as well i would encourage uh, uh the just based on my experience in say, in in other markets i would encourage uh the uh, mca and others to to not rush into making these amendments but to uh discuss with the with the marketplace whether it's through open uh forums of uh of proposing regulatory changes and seeing what what the market has to say uh before those proposed rules are adopted or through uh more targeted discussions with uh with particular groups to understand what the impact of some changes would be uh because very often there are unintended consequences when you go ahead and just make uh amendments without a a full sum analysis of them uh with different market participants so i would encourage uh some of that uh i would say that uh yes we we we've seen some some common issues uh that that do need to be fixed and fixed pretty quickly um we we heard that the pendulum 
uh, has swung from very debtor friendly to, from some people's perspective, neutral to other people's perspective, uh, too creditor friendly. But we have seen a couple changes from an uh, investor perspective, from a foreign investor perspective. And let me just mention those couple things. Uh, one, uh, as Ed asked uh, in one of the questions, we've seen distressed investors. I've, I've worked with distressed investors uh, looking at buying debt in the secondary market uh, and to, to use that as a foothold into uh, working with uh, the company, either through the IBPC process or, or outside of it, to, to improve their, uh, their leverage and improve their valuation as a result. So you have that, that going on. Um, as Kausab just mentioned, this is a hostile situation as well. It, it, or it's uniquely, uh, it, it makes uh, the, the interaction between the, the company and the, the bidder in a, a hostile situation, which is not very common in Asia. You don't see hostile takeovers as you do in, in, in the West. And, uh, and the inherent problems associated with, with that where there's an information disadvantage. You know, the, the promoters are not dying to share a lot of information. Management's not dying to share. It's, they might not even be around to share information. So there's an in information disadvantage. And the third thing I would say is, um, and we've both seen this, that our traditional private equity clients are seeing um, you know, promoters, uh, when, when we see the, with the creditor in possession model, uh, they are increasingly fearful of, of uh, running the risk of losing their company, and they see that's a real risk under the IBC. And so what they do is they proactively approach uh, either existing investors to, to find a resolution or approach new investors to bring in fresh capital to deleverage the company and, and address the situation, which is helpful for foreign investors looking to find uh, investment opportunities at uh, more attractive valuations as, attra as valuations have continued to rise in, uh, in different sectors. Um, so th those are the, the few perspectives I would add. Thank you very much. Thanks. Hi, um, <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, so my, my name is Suharsh. I'm a partner at AZBN Partners. Um, so one of our founding partners, Mr. Behram Vakil, who was around uh, till a few uh, minutes back. I've worked very closely with him in advising the government in drafting of the bankruptcy code, and worked very closely with Dr. Sahu on drafting the rules and regulations under the bankruptcy code. Uh, since then, AZB has been advising many of the bidders, committee of creditors, and resolution professionals, including in the large 12 accounts which were referred to bankruptcy code by the Reserve Bank of India. So I've been very closely involved in this field, and uh, to be fair, I've also had a very close emotional connect with the IBC because I was part of the drafting committee, and I've been monitoring it very closely. Um, so I think I, I agree with most of uh, the speakers today that uh, given how poor India's credit laws were, IBC has been an unqualified success. But I think we have spoken a lot today about how successful the IBC has been. And I'm going to just talk about a couple of aspects in the IBC which, in my opinion, have not been working very well. And uh, those are a few words of caution which I think we need to work together on to resolve. Um, I'll start off by the definition of a financial debt under the bankruptcy code, or the definition of a loan under the bankruptcy code, which says that money lent uh, for the purpose of earning interest or which incorporates the time value of money. Now, I think for the first time in Indian law, we have the concept of time value of money actually hard-coded in the black letter of law. Uh, in none of the other laws in India do we have the concept of time value of money hard-coded in, in any legislation. So I think one of the main yardsticks by which we need to, let, to judge how successful the IBC has been to see how much the time value of money has been respected during the course of the proceedings. Um, like any other law, IBC has got various institutional pillars. We've spoken about the MCA, the IBBI, the resolution professionals, and so on. But we haven't spoken a lot about the NCLT, the judiciary. And I believe the weakest link in the IBC so far, uh, with due respect, has been the NCLT. So I'll touch upon a few of the reasons why NCLT has not been that successful, and how that's actually hurting and compromising the recovery for banks and the time value of money. Uh, I think the greatest example to that would be the fact that yesterday, as many of you would be aware, State Bank of India put up its uh, loan in SR Steel up for sale. Uh, even though State Bank was going to get an 85% recovery from the bid made by Aslamithil. But 
evidently the largest and most powerful bank in the country it doesn't have enough faith in how much longer it's going to take to resolve the matter at NCLT. And therefore, it was forced to sell its loan to, um, in the secondary market. Now, why, why exactly is that happening? What's the, why are there delays at the NCLT? And what's gone wrong with the philosophy of judges who are sitting in the NCLT? I'll, I'll just delve upon that a little bit. Uh, so there are two or three things which I think are, are, are really troublesome. Um, first of all, NCLT judges uh, <clears throat> come with a little bit of a socialist mindset, which was prevalent in the BIFR days, which was you know, under the old Sikh Industrial Companies Act. So what we are finding is that there's a very strong tendency or there's a very strong anti-liquidation bias. So at the end of the 270-day process, if there's been no viable resolution, the company is supposed to be liquidated. But the judges feel that a liquidation is the worst possible outcome, which will lead to loss of jobs, loss of income, and a further provisioning for banks. But, and because of that, many companies which are actually zombie companies, they are not fit for you know, being run as a going concern and deserve to be liquidated, are being flogged and kept alive artificially on the basis of resolution plans which are not commercially viable. And the reason the NCLT is doing that is because they feel you know, loss of jobs and the impact on the economy. But I mean, my, my submission over there is that the bankruptcy code is not going to lead to uh, commercially viable firms. The bankruptcy code is a conduit towards realizing the true economic value of a firm, as opposed to enhancing the economic value of a firm. And the liquidation, if the committee of creditors actually feels that this company deserves to be liquidated, then we should not infantilize the thought process of the committee of creditors and give them what they commercially feel is correct. The second issue I feel is a tendency to legislate. Now, in the, the, the job or the function of a judiciary is to interpret the law and to implement the law, but it's not to create law unless there is something which is unconstitutional. You know, they should not strike it down. But in the bankruptcy space, we have seen that judges have been actually interpreting the bankruptcy code in such a way that they are changing essential and fundamental provisions of it. To give you an example, and I'm sure some of the panelists may be aware, <clears throat> the bankruptcy code provides that operational creditors should be given their liquidation value. Now that is something which the parliament in its wisdom has hard-coded into the law. It's a policy decision of the parliament. But the NCLT in a recent case in Binani uh, Cement, the NCLAT, the Appellate Tribunal, actually held that <coughs> that's a very unfair result and it will hamper the small creditors and the uh, small and medium sector uh, companies in the economy and therefore that's there is, you should not give them only liquidation value, but pay them at par with the banks. Uh, now that's something which is not the mandate of a judge. If that provision was unconstitutional, they could strike it down, but they cannot take a policy call on how the legislation should be. Uh, the third point I'd like to talk about is how they are also interfering in many cases in the commercial decision making. Now the commercial decision making is something which is completely removed from the ambit of NCLT judges in the infrastructure of the IBC because it was felt that the committee of creditors which has public sector banks, private funds, NBFCs, they are best equipped to decide and they are the most sophisticated players to decide how a company should be restructured. And a judge is not the right person to decide that. And judge should only act as a referee in case certain parameters in, a, in the code are not being followed, then the judge should interfere and should not get into the specifics. So there have been cases where the resolution plan has been approved by the committee of creditors, but the judges have intervened and said that, well, you should not pay out the debt in the next 15 years, but pay it in 10 years. Don't pay at a coupon of 8%, pay at a coupon of 8.5%. So again, those are commercial points which the judges should not interfere in. And the last point I'll touch upon is how there's a capacity uh, issue at the NCLT. So there are 11 NCLTs currently, three more have been ordered uh, to be set up and one more has been set up uh, currently at Jaipur. But the fact remains that the most heavily burdened NCLTs are Bombay, Ahmedabad, Delhi and Calcutta, which basically would reflect the heat map of how the industrial sector in India is and where they are concentrated. There need to be more judges in these NCLTs. Uh, secondly, there's only one appellate tribunal. The NCLAT is only one tribunal. There needs to be more tribunals. So all the, the decisions of the NCLT which are appealed are getting stuck at the NCLAT level. And lastly, we need dedicated benches of the NCLT focusing only on bankruptcy. Currently, the NCLT is looking at company law matters, which deals with mergers and amalgamations, dealing with competition or antitrust matters, as well as bankruptcy. 
so they, you know, in any case, they are stretched. And on top of that, there are other legislations they're also looking after. Um, so these are some of the concerns which I, I thought I should, I should bring to the fore because somehow they are not spoken of that, that often. Uh, in terms of how the solution is, I think there needs to be more training, more conversations, more engagement and dialogue with judges, which traditionally has been a weaker aspect of Indian lawmaking and, and, and judiciary. Uh, there's a culture and there's a belief that judges should be removed from industry and removed from market participants so they can do better justice delivery. But in my opinion, in a commercial court like NCLT, it's very important for judges to be commercially aware, understand the dynamics of resolution plans, the interest of parties and where they're coming from. Um, I can talk a lot more, I'm sorry, but I think I've, I've already spoken enough. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Ed? Oh, you know who I am. Um, so uh, I thought that f as from the US perspective, there were three, um, three comments. Uh, <coughs> and some of these are actually have been uh, come up in the Q&A. I think from an American perspective, the pendulum in bankruptcy swung too far uh, in India, but it has swung not, it swung too far in the opposite direction outside of bankruptcy. And what I mean is that in the United States, the bankruptcy law is debtor friendly, but other co collection laws are extremely creditor friendly. It's very easy to foreclose on assets in the United States. It's very easy to collect on judgments in the United States. It's very speedy. I mean, it's, it's tr just even stark. This is not business, but take consumers. In Texas, you can foreclose in someone's home in 30 days. It's extremely fast. Bankruptcy is a counterweight to the extreme creditor friendliness under non-bankruptcy law. So under ordinary civil law, very creditor friendly. Bankruptcy provides a balance to that. And what that means is that creditors have a lot of power. Debtors choose bankruptcy to get a little more bargaining power, and then there's this dance that occurs in bankruptcy, and there's a lot of rules. And I think that we've, I think in the United States, I, I think it's been a very successful process that creditors have enough control in bankruptcy that they can't be uh, railroaded, but debtors get much more power than they would outside. So we have a dance. And I, what I worry about in, in India is I think that the civil law system for collecting debts is, seems to be very inefficient, that it takes a very long time to collect debts, so that the bankruptcy code is, in India is doing, and like, it's what I said in my question to Dr. Sahu, I think it's doing too much work. It's, it's both a collection device for operational creditors, it's also a collective proceeding for mass defaults, for insolvent firms, and it, it, it's hard to do everything at once. And so I, my fear is that the, that in a world where you're relying on the bankruptcy code to do lots of things and you've chosen a very creditor-friendly law, that there could be consequences down the road. One of those is that we know from, inter, from international comparisons of bankruptcy laws that if you make your debt collection laws very creditor-friendly, it has the obvious consequence that smaller businesses or entrepreneurs take on less debt. And that could be good. You might think it's the delevering that we, was spoken of by, by the, uh, earlier today, but delevering isn't necessarily a good thing. It might, it, it's to be sure there can be excessive debt, but when firms, what we see and we look at countries like Germany, United States, you can look at a lot of different countries, when that delevering, what it means is that entrepreneurs take on less debt and they start hoarding very liquid assets that can be used to pay in the event of default. They hold on to too much cash. So that means that entrepreneurs don't take on risk. And if you value growth, that's not necessarily a good recipe for growth if your entrepreneurs are scared of taking on risk. So one of my fears is I think that the, the fear that the bankruptcy law is, the pendulum, I think, in my perspective, may have swung a little too far. And I think the hope is that, that you will see regulations that kind of ease um, some of that creditor pressure, such as extending perhaps the 270-day deadline, as seems to be happening. Um, the second point I want to make is that I think that um, that uh, in the United States, one problem we've struggled with, and I think I see it even on the panel today, is that we struggle with this idea that um, bankruptcy has, um, is, you can either talk about it as saving a firm, or you can talk about it as um, resolving the debts. And we do those simultaneously in bankruptcy, you know, that you you're, have a resolution plan that simultaneously picks the value of the firm and who gets paid what. But those are conceptually different questions. You could say, what's the value of the firm? Sell it off, get some cash, and then determine who's owed what. And in the United States, we found out that over time that what takes 
a hell of a long time is a who owes, who's owed what question. How, what are the debts of the firm? Um, how do you value those debts? And maybe in the, some cases, it's very hard to know who the creditors are. You know, the easiest case is like, suppose there's been a massive accident. You don't know who all the victims are. You don't know how much they're owed. Even debts where the firm is, like what we're finding in the United States, that a creditor may say you've been delinquent and that you owe default interest rate for the past year. Well, were you, were you, you know, was the firm in default for how long? These are very complicated questions. There could be questions about fraudulent conveyances, that maybe an insider received a transfer, and that takes a long time to litigate. But these, but, so we found the United States is some of the most time-consuming questions have nothing to do with the value of the firm. So one, what, what, we're, what we're trying to do now in the United States through a sale process is try to have very quick sales of the assets and then let the case last as long as you want to resolve these other questions. Because as a matter of um, sort of social welfare, what we really care about is getting the assets moved into the hands of those who can value the most and use those assets properly. And then the other question is just redistribution. Like who's going to get what amount of money? And so you might, so you could think about in India that you could say that maybe you should have two deadlines, that maybe the 270 day deadline is only for selling the assets off, but be more patient in the distribution. Um, so previously they were talking that um, one of the speakers, I forget which one, maybe it was a secretary, said that, that there's a debate about whether the litigation in court should count, account, count against the 270 day deadline. And that's what I'm kind of getting at. The litigation is oftentimes over who is owed what. That's kind of a separate question. You might want to have a speedy sale, but then let it go forever on who gets what. I mean, that's just like a less important social question. I think the, the last thing we've learned in the United States is that um, in terms of liquidity, in terms of having liquidity to buy assets out of bankruptcy, it's, um, the metaphor I'll use is, uh, have you ever seen this movie, Field of Dreams? It's about baseball. It's, it's not even a very good movie. But there's a famous line in the movie called, if you build it, they will come. So in the movie, this guy believes in ghosts. And he feels if he builds a, a, a ballpark, a baseball stadium, these ghosts of ancient baseball players will show up. So there's a story, if you build it, they will come. But it's using the United States, this metaphor, if you take steps, great things will happen. And I think that could happen here, that if you build certainty into the legal system, that you have very clear priority rules, um, you take a position on deadlines and just make them very clear, what we found in the United States is that hedge funds crave legal certainty. And so if you can have very clear priority rules, very clear rules on deadlines, and as Sue Harsh was saying, very clear rules on what judges can and can't do. So distressed, it, it was tr just as Sue Harsh was saying, in the United States in the 1980s, we had the exact same problems. Many judges had a socialist mindset that they didn't want to shut down companies because they wanted to preserve employment. There are famous cases written up in famous finance journals about this problem. We had the same problem of capacity, not enough judges. Uh, we had the same problem of, um, uh, I guess in the capacity problem is that um, what creditors realized is that the, there were some judges who you could count on to not be socialist. Some judges would shut the firm down. But it turned out those some judges were in Delaware or New York. So everybody files there, and then you get this capacity problem. And so what we slowly do, sort of fit, what we've done over time is realize that, that, we've, that we've tried to make the law clear. It's not as clear as it should be. And we've tried to really invest in the judges so that um, Increasingly, judges in New York and in Delaware, there's more of them, um, and they're drawn from commercial practice. So um, most, many of the judges are former bankruptcy lawyers or former contract lawyers, and so they're not as scared of shutting the firm down. And so when you talk to hedge funds in the United States, they say this is what helps them, and, and that a clear legal system, judges that they can count on to not be, in the United States called crazy, um, and it provides lots of liquidity. It makes it, e it makes it easier to attract investment to buy assets, to buy debts, because outsiders know how much more how to predict what's going to happen in the bankruptcy process. So when I, when you when I say if you build it, it will, they will come, it's that I think that as certainty is produced through the legal system, through judicial decisions, through the amendment process, I think liquidity will come. I think it will be much easier for outsiders to invest in the Indian bankruptcy system as in, in the coming years as a lot of the certainty develops. One last point is, and, it, and some, uh, it came out in a question, I do think that one size doesn't fit all, and I think that we're, what we're learning now, and it's taken us 40 years to learn it, is that you need different rules for small and medium-sized businesses. Right now, Congress in the United States is considering a brand new set of rules to speed up the small business process, 
and also give um, the owners of the business more control. In the typical United States bankruptcy, shareholders are wiped out. They get nothing at the end of the process. We're, tr we're thinking of changing that in the case of small businesses because we realize for many small businesses, the business is the person. Think of a carpenter, a contractor. And, but we're just, this is a long way of saying is that I think that, that you may, India may discover this too, and I think that was one of the questions out there, that, the, that you might need two tracks. You might need separate bankruptcy laws for small and medium businesses as opposed to large corporations because the needs of the small business that they can't afford an expensive process and you may need the help of the entrepreneur in the course of the process. It's, if you have a large corporation, it may be easy to kick out the shareholders because someone else can run that firm. If you have a small co uh, carpenter or contractor, if you kick out the carpenter or the contractor, there's no business anymore. So you've got to keep that person in place. And so what we're what we're, what's in Congress right now is a set of rules to kind of induce the carpenter and contractor to stay around by offering more attractive bankruptcy rules. Right, thank you very much, Ed. Just wanted to give one chance to the panel members uh, now that we have all heard uh, every other person's views. Do you have some response to any of the comments that you have heard from other, other panel members? Uh, I, for one, uh, was very intrigued by the absence of uh, fund Absence of funding? I'm sorry. Thank you, Ed. Uh, I was uh, struck by the absence of funding for, uh, you know, uh, in the steel industry. Uh, where do you see that uh, going? Do you see, uh, you know, do you see some institutions developing to address this concern yes, as uh, greater clarity comes about the way in which this code is going to uh, be implemented? No, I think, uh, I'm audible. Maybe just give him the microphone. Okay. Yeah, I think this works now. So I think to the, uh, you know, to the point that, uh, for example, that hedge funds, for example, have started coming in with more regulatory uh, certainty on the process, et cetera. So one of the arguments always was that nobody invests in Indian distressed debt because prior to the IBC, there wasn't really an effective mechanism to recover your debt from the normal courts, right? Now that has changed with the IBC and that, that obviously will bring in this new set of lenders. But the other part of the equation is that India also operates in a very tightly regulated investment climate, right? So even if a venture capitalist wants to sort of come in, there'll be a lot of regulations in terms of the vehicles through which he can bring in those uh, funds, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of the constraints that I'm referring to are constraints which are regulatorily imposed, right? So if somebody commercially wants to, uh, you know, come and fund that project today, they won't be able to because of the regulatory constraints. So the, only way around that is to relax those regulations. For example, the only way to get foreign money directly into uh, an Indian acquisition is to relax the ECB regulations. The only way to get a bond investor to come and buy a domestic currency bond which can be used to fund an acquisition is to, re is to relax the foreign portfolio investor guidelines, for example. Right? So it's, it's those kind of issues which, uh, which prevail. I think they've, they've already been uh, represented. I'm told they're also being looked into. Uh, and I think that the second part of the, uh, the equation is the Indian banking system, right? Which is that the Indian banking system, because of these bankruptcies, is going through so much of stress that they've eroded capital. They don't have a source of fresh capital unless government infuses capital into a lot of these public sector entities. So it's not necessarily an issue of liquidity, but it's an issue of risk appetite and the unavailability of risk capital to be able to lend to these projects. So I think that's another sort of big concern. That's of course a concern for, for the bankruptcy area as such, but that's also a larger concern for the, for the economy as a whole and, and funding the general industrial growth as well. I want to pick up on your uh, first point a little bit. Uh, it strikes me that uh, the regulators were dealing with venture capital, you know, uh, to improve the funding of distressed assets and the regulators were regulating the bankruptcy reform. Are they one and the same or is there regulatory fragmentation that is going to make this whole process a little bit slow? Uh, well, I, I, would, I would say from my perspective, uh, to, there are more regulations at, uh, and for foreign investment coming into India uh, than in, in just about any other country I've seen in, in, in Asia. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, uh, and there are different, you know, you have RBI regulations, you have, uh, you have uh, MCA regulations, you have SEBI regulations. 
uh, and, and now you have IVPI regulations on the, on, the, uh, on the bankruptcy side. And then you have different industries that are highly regulated. And I think when Suharsh and I were talking about this the, uh, a few, few days ago, uh, he was pointing out that recovery in, in different in industries varies significantly. And it's probably because there's more regulation in the, ones, uh, in the industries where there's less recovery. So, so I'm, I'm very keen to know to what extent these regulators are talking to each other to make sure that uh, the reform introduced in by one set of regulatory agents, you get the maximum leverage out of it by making some collateral reforms uh, in other area. Do you see an openness in that? So I, I think, sorry, sorry. Yeah, please. Uh, so I, I think in the um, bankruptcy space, I think we've been very fortunate to see a lot of uh, conversations between the regulators and a lot of coordination between the regulators. To give you some examples, if you're taking over a listed firm in a bankruptcy in a resolution plan, then SEBI has granted various exemptions, whether it be to making an open offer, uh, whether it for, be for delisting, and so on. So various exemptions have been granted by SEBI. Uh, even the Income Tax Act, I mean, the fact remains that under the liquidation waterfall, income tax used to be one of the top uh, to get paid out. <coughs> That's changed now under the bankruptcy court. They're number five of the, uh, of the waterfall. And the fact that the finance ministry and the income tax department agreed to something like this itself is, 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 is quite a big thing. I'm pleasantly surprised. It is. Yeah. And this was, in fact, based on the UK law, because in the UK it was called the crown preference, which was removed later on. And in the UK there are now some discussions about moving crown back to the top. But thankfully in India we haven't heard those murmurs yet. Um, yet. 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 <laughs> Um, so, so I think the, the regulators, the financial sector regulators, have been talking to each other. Um, I think when it comes to certain other regulations, such as mining regulations or power sector regulations, which are specific to certain industries, I think the problem lies over there. If you look at the power sector, for example, I mean the distress in the power sector is not purely financial distress. It's on account of power purchase agreements, on account of the import cost of the raw material, on account of how the state distribution companies themselves are bankrupt and they cannot pay their bills on time. So those are, so there are specific regulatory issues in the various industries. Uh, the saving grace, as I said, is that the financial sector regulators have been talking to each other. Uh, there are still certain reforms which are on the anvil. So for example, if you're a foreign portfolio investor, then the RBI recently introduced certain concentration norms. So if you are in buying debt of a company, it cannot be beyond a certain threshold, which makes doing business for them very tough. So there are people who are making representations to the RBI, and the good thing is that they are listening. You know, I mean, whether a change happens or not, we'll see, but there's certainly an open communication. Yes. 